Uh, all right, so uh, today, more MATLAB. I always like to think that uh, this is a good start to the morning. Like, this is like the breakfast for the brain, a little MATLAB coding, uh, just to get your day started right. And so that's what we're going to do today for you, because when you're in the sciences, this is how you should be rolling. Every morning you get up, write yourself a little MATLAB script, just like, ah, oh, start off the day right. I'll do a little workout in the morning with Josh, but Josh will ignore you at the gym. <laughs> when anybody goes down there, Josh will walk right by you and like, well, I don't know you. <sighs> Terrible. Anyway, we'll get them talking to people. Uh, there's that, and then, and then you work out a little bit, and then you do a little MATLAB coding, and you know, frankly, if nothing else happens good, that, that you've already done, you've already accomplished something. One must not deny that. So today we'll start off with a little MATLAB coding, just to get to stay on. And we're going to start off exactly where we left off yesterday, uh, Monday. And we're going to take images. We have noisy images, and what we're going to do is take these knit images that are noisy and start thinking about how to denoise them. Okay, so pull this back up, and this thing is always annoying because it keeps going out. So let's start off here. Uh, I'm taking the code we wrote on Monday, essentially. Uh, and here's what this code says. Let's start off with uh, the little first section here in blue. Comment image analysis. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to load in a fo photo. I am read. Photo, it's a TIFF file. Okay, so you may have JPEGs, whatever you got, whatever the data format, you can put it in here, uh, bring it in. So by the way, these are four images that are, in fact, photos. What I do want to convey to you is a lot of the image processing issues and mathematics that we have going on here can generically be applied to sort of data sets, right? There's, there's nothing special here about it being an image. It's just that we are going to apply it to an image, and it's a lot easier to see what happens in the data processing through an image. Okay, now this image is in color. I'm going to make a black and white version of it. A, B, W for black and white, right? And what you do is you take this RGB color cube, which is the A, and you say RGB to gray, A. And so what this does is it sets the weights of the red, green, blue RGB cube to make it grayscale. Okay, now uh, the big difference between A, B, W, and A, we'll see down here. A is going to be a 600 by 800 matrix by three. Okay, so it's a cube of data. By three, the three is the RGB components. In other words, it tells you for every pixel point, it specifies three values to get the right color. Okay, whereas once you turn it into grayscale. There's none of that. The grayscale is essentially, in some sense, graded on a 0 to 1. 1 is white, 0 is black, everything in between is gray. Okay? All right. So we plot these images. Image A, we take off the tick marks. Now, uh, at this point, they are integer, uh, they are matrices that are just integers. Okay? So you, you can't just do standard manipulations on them because they're in format of uint8, uint8, okay? So you have to turn them into double precision numbers, double A, double ABW, so I've called A2 and ABW, and then I can look at the size of these things, and we'll verify that they're 600, this one here is going to be 600 by 800 by 3 for the color, 600 by 800 for the black and white, okay? So that is the first part of the code. All right, so let's go to the second part of the code here. And I'm just going to add noise to these images. Okay. Now, if I add noise to the image, what I'm going to do is just take, go to every single pixel point and just simply add a little bit of Gaussian noise to that pixel point. Okay. So what I do is I go over here and I say, okay, let's uh, go ahead and say my noise for the color piece is going to be a 600 by 800 by 3 rand n. So what it does is it makes a big matrix. 600 600 by 800 by 3, so it's a matrix cube, as it were. And for every component, there is a, uh, of that matrix, it's a, ran, a Gaussian, distri normally distributed random variable, uh, mean, zero mean uh, unit variance. Okay? Over here, for noise 2, noise 2 will be the black and white noise I want to add, which is a random variable, 600 by 800. I don't need the cube of it. So here I'm going to tickle the whole color cube, not just component 
like, so this is the hard part. When you do color images, you can't just, how do you add noise to a color image? Well, you have to, you add noise to it, but it's kind of got these three color components. So you have to go in there and actually change every one. That's what this is going to do. And this one here, black and white, is just going to take every pixel and change its value slightly. Okay? And I have a new value is U and U2. U is going to be my color image plus some noise strength, 50 times this random noise to it. It's going to take this random variable, add it to what I have. I can control this parameter 50. If I make it bigger, it's more noisy. Less, it's less noisy. Uh, and then I can do this to the black and white cube as well. And then I use this here, because this is all double precision, and I can convert this back to uint8, which is the image format for the, for the, for the data. Okay, so if I, can, if I do that, then I can plot image, image, and it thinks of these things as now JPEGs with a bunch of noise on them, essentially. Okay, and I can plot them. So let's stop right there and see what we get. Uh, so break. Oh, did I just do something stupid? Yeah, let's undo that. Uh, can I get one more? There we go. Yeah, I didn't quite want to delete what I just talked about. All right. Nice subplot of these. And here was that nice pretty picture. So I took the color image. That's right, coffee cup. Nice. Look at the little, okay. So we got that coffee cup. We added noise to it. There it is. Who would want to do that to a coffee? Beautiful cappuccino. Nobody. But we did. Now we got to clean it up. Black and white image, grayscale. So our objective is to say, suppose you give me this. What do we do to clean it up? Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the primary objective, right? Uh, most of the time, these canned examples are kind of interesting, right? You start out with the perfect image. And then what you do is you uh, actually artificially put noise on it. And you know what you're trying to get back to. So you're already preconditioned to kind of know what you're looking for. Now, this is uh, contrary to most cases where you get something that has a lot of noise on it. And by the way, remember, this is, could be generically some kind of data set. I am plotting, for instance, the temperature fluctuations in the ocean. So it doesn't look like a coffee cup. It just looks like a bunch of noise, perhaps. And what you're trying to pull out of there in the sort of some denoising process is maybe a bunch of it is noise. If I extract that out, is there some kind of pattern that I can see? won't be a coffee cup, but look at that. Look, maybe you have some kind of midstream super sweet swirls like that in your ocean data, just like in my cappuccino cup. Okay, so maybe you have that, and so you can pull that out. All right, but you always start here. But it's always good to know when you build your routines, like you can noise it and try to reproduce it afterwards. Okay, and mostly what we're going to do is play around with this uh, black and white image here. Okay, now the other thing I did to this is the following. I said, uh, and at least this part we're starting to become more familiar with, which is images themselves are no different than signals. You can think of this whole image as simply Fourier domain. Put it in the Fourier domain. This image has a, comp has a Fourier picture to it. And you can think of the whole image as frequencies. Okay? So this is what we did in the next part of the code. And that gives us a lot of flexibility for how we want to clean up images. And here's what we did. Uh, so this is what we did in class last time. And I just want to continue here. So here's the blue piece of code. I'm going to make a new matrix, ABW2, which turns out when you use image, do you remember I, it got plotted upside down last time? It counts from. 1 to 60, whereas in UDP color, it goes 1 to 60 from the bottom up. So I'm going to flip that around. So I'm going to flip my image. So this is all this is going to do. So I'm going to take the 1 by 600 rows in ABW and then flip them upside down. So I'm going to start with 600 and go to 1. That, that's all this does. Okay. So now I can take this image. I can p-color it, put it in some kind of color map, and uh, Where's my FFT2 command? Did I, did I lose that somewhere? 
Did you see it? Down, down, down. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I hit it. I made so many commands all at once. That I, didn't even, I just was being so smooth. I didn't even know how smooth I was, but now I know. Okay. So smooth. Uh, and here it was. Yeah, you take this ABW, you FFT to it, right? And then you shift it to undo the, the shift that the FFT does. Look at its absolute value. And now we can plot this thing here. And that was the spectrum. And I did a color map plot. So another way to think about these images, and by the way, this is the perfect image. There it is. Now, this is a, an important representation of, of the image. Right? You say, this thing here is really just that. Of course, this makes a lot more sense visually to us, obviously. Right? But ultimately, what does this do? It says, look, in this cup, there are scales. I have the artwork that has a certain frequency. It has a certain wavelength, this short scale stuff. I have things like saucers, which are long, long wavelength things. Uh, I have big scale structure like this thing up here. And so what this does is it picks out scales. right? That's all that's doing, essentially, when you Fourier transform. So it's just a different way to visualize an image. Now, in image analysis, this is important because now it really makes a tie back to all the stuff we've been talking about in the time frequency domain stuff, right? You take, for, for instance, your homework that you're doing now on the music, right? You're just saying, look, this is a signal in time. I can think about putting this thing in some kind of frequency space and thinking about this as a collection of frequencies. Same thing here. This is an image, and I'm just thinking about representing it in this space here. But the nice idea about representing in this space here is that one of the things you notice right away is that there's actually only a small fraction of the Fourier modes that are having a role here. I'm going to show you one more plot of this, by the way. Uh, here's the Fourier transform of this with, um, this is not quite Fourier transform, it's the log of the Fourier transform. Okay? I did the log for a very specific reason. Because I'm going to show you now the Fourier transform of this just straight up. No log. And you'll then <coughs> see. So let's come over here and just plot Fourier transform of this image. You see this red dot right there? I do. Yeah, okay. Uh, pretty much, there's a dominant set of Fourier modes sitting in there. Everything else there that was brought to life on the log scale, it only seems like it's important because it's on the log scale. In other words, most frequency components are playing a very small and limited role. Now, I can zoom in on this to get a little better picture of that region. So let me push this here and... There we go. Okay. So you see, there, there's something there. That's the, that's like 99% of the energy sitting in the, nine, I don't know, I didn't actually, I just did that in my head. I'm making that number up. But probably it's over 80% of the energy sits in a small <laughs> collection of modes near zero. Okay? So, so when we look at that log picture, you have to remember that uh, a lot of that stuff out there is quite small. All right. Boom. So when I plot this, you know, there's very little energy out here. Okay, so this gives us the first concept of the idea of data compression, right? Which is I take the Fourier transform of this. I have all these Fourier modes. And I could say, well, you know what? I could probably do a pretty good job representing this image if I just cut out that little box right in the middle there, throw away you know, 80% of my data, probably can reconstruct it pretty nicely with just a small fraction of what I have. And that's the idea of, <coughs> of, of compression. Okay? So that's, that's how you do a compression algorithm in JPEG. You just say, you know, let's throw away everything that's smaller below some value. Cut it off. Oh, you want worse resolution or better? Well, we'll, we'll set the level of where we throw Fourier modes away and just keep exactly what you need. And this is how you do compression. Because most of this is completely empty out there. 
All right. Now, when I add noise to this, by the way, noise tends to generate energy at all these frequencies. Like if you have noise all over this thing, it creates very fine scale structure. And the fine scale structure, which you can see here in this original plot, oop, right there, if you look at that plot, the fine scale structure has very high frequencies, right? So somehow noise, if you have kind of some important image, a lot of times noise stuff sits there with very high frequencies. And you know what? Why don't we just filter it? It's exactly how you saved your dog, right? You filtered, high, you filtered out something. You said, let's kill off all this noise sitting around here. And ultimately what you did is you built uh, a bandpass filter. You figured out what frequency this thing was at, and you built a bandpass filter around there. And here what we want to do is just do basically take this bandpass filter and put it around the primary features, which were clearly located around the zero wavelengths. So you build a low-pass filter. You say, keep the low frequencies, kill everything off, and let's see if we can clean that image up. OK? So that's what we're going to do. All right. So in some sense, this is like saving your dog again, except now we're saving art. It's even sort of more altruistic and better for humanity. Your dog, you know, its carbon footprint might have been kind of big. And if it died, well, you're just helping the earth too. OK, but now saving art, that's forever. So let's go save some art. So uh, let's start off with this idea here. And I'm going to first of all go ahead and that was what we worked on last time. So that's kind of a recap. Um, and what I want to do is go ahead and text it. I'm going to do this and go text, <coughs> comment. I think I'm going to still need uh, these guys here. Let's keep this. All right. So I'm going to forget all that stuff that was just processing it. Um, and what I want to do is make a new matrix B, which is the black and white photo plus There, I'm going to noise it at a level of 100. Now let's just check out image B and just see what this is going to do. So this is the black and white photo. Oh, so not black and white. So when you do image B, when this, this is basically uh, the default color. This is a matrix now, and you're just imaging the matrix. The default color on a matrix is not grayscale. Okay, So we can certainly do grayscale. I think. I am show will, I think, really do that for us. There we go. Bunch of noise. So I'm handed this image. You can kind of see a little bit still the cup in there, right? I mean, it's kind of there. Now, had I not shown you the cup before, right, then you, would, you might have more ideas about what it might be. You already know what the image is supposed to be like. So this is part of the uh, perception issue that you already have. You already know what the image is supposed to be like. So you already, in your mind, you've cleaned it up, right? You've already denoised this thing in your mind to know, oh, there's a coffee cup here. There's the spoon. There's this. But it could be uh, a top hat. It could be uh, a flower petal. It could be a car. No, I'm probably not a car. Could be uh, your grandma. I don't know. All kinds of things, right? You don't know exactly. As you clean it up, you'll start seeing more and more what the image should look like. So that's kind of what we want to go after here. Take this image, denoise it. Now, this noise creates very fine scale fluctuations. So all we're going to do is take this thing and do exactly how we saved the dot. We're going to say, let's just put a filter over this thing, kill off all the high frequency components, see what we get back out. Okay. All right, so first, to look at this more carefully, we want to, of course, put it in the Fourier domain. So let's come over here. Um, and I think, by the way, this is, becomes harder to do the more noise you add, of course, but fine. Let's come over here. Now let's just say, okay, I've got this B, and I have its Fourier transform, which is 
just like that. Done. So now I have, the, I have the image. I have its representation in terms of frequencies. And let's call uh, the shifted Fourier transform that. OK, so this is the thing I actually want to plot. And let's see where we are right now. Let's just plot the, the image as we build this thing up. So this is, goes back to, and by the way, we're going to plot it now as in its image format. By doing that u int 8, it just basically puts it back into image format versus p color format, right? Um, p color is really a, a uh, it's, it's working on matrices. Now I convert it back to a real image, a JPEG image, and let's just plot that JPEG image. Now what we're going to do is p color, however, the spectrum, the log of the absolute value of BTS. Shading terp, color map gray. Okay, and let's look at that. So this now, this is what we have. This is our noised image. Uh-oh, someone's complaining. I'm balanced parentheses. Where are I'm missing one. You're right there. Okay. All right. Sweet. Yeah? Oh, that would be uh, <coughs> like that. That would be good. Dude, you guys, you guys saw all this happening, and you didn't even tell me it was happening. You told me afterwards. All right. I should bring treats to class, and if you tell me before I press the enter button, you get like a Snickers bar or something. Okay, I think you'd probably let me do it anyway still, <laughs> that's all right. All right, noisy image, Fourier transform. You can still see it. There's some clear signature there. Now at the beginning of this process, you don't know if that is important to the image or not. If you filter that out, are you filtering something important in your image? Okay, so these are questions that obviously are sometimes hard to address. Part of what you want to understand is, okay, do I expect, is there some physical process, suppose this is some data I had, is there a physical process where I'm expecting, suppose this is ocean data and this is measures in miles, you know, I have this huge ocean data and 800 by 600 mile of the ocean and I'm looking at some spectral data here and I'm saying, yeah, actually I understand why there's stuff going on on the hundreds of meters cycle for whatever I'm measuring. Uh, you know, and, if, and if you don't expect things like that, and you expect it just kind of random fluctuations, then you can say, okay, I'm going to average over that. And basically what I want to do is apply a filter around here. And I can play with the filter to see how much of this I can get rid of and then image back what I have here. So in this plot over here, I'm going to plot the filtered version of this. And then what we're going to do is take the inverse Fourier transform and then plot our reconstructed, cleaned up image of this. Okay. Everybody okay with that so far? All right. So that's the objective right now. So first of all, we've got to build a filter. So uh, if you notice uh, in this, fil uh, this is an 800 by 600 matrix. It's FFT, so the center point of KX and KY in that, those units are 401 and 301, right? So if you go from uh, zero, 1 to 800, you got 401 is your center point of the frequency. That's your zero mode. 301 is your center point of the Y direction. So we're going to build a filter around those values. So. Uh, we need wave numbers, so kx will be our x direction k wave. They go one from one to eight hundred. Ky will be one to six hundred. And then let's mesh grid these so that this command here is going to make them two dimensional. Okay. So at this point, what you've got. Let me bring that up for you guys there. Filter. So if we set up. The wave numbers in the x direction, wave numbers in the y direction. 
This makes it two-dimensional. Now the kx and ky that come out are matrices, but they understand that I'm the x direction, you're the y direction. Okay, so that's what it sets up. So now we're ready to filter in, K, in, in x and y, kx and ky. So we're going to build filters around this, and the simplest filter to build is a Gaussian. So we'll build a filter, and all right, so here's the filter. F equals F <laughs> equals. There you go. Gaussian, let's make it uh, width. There's a width parameter. Let's make it 0 0.01 for a moment. Uh, width times, now we need Kx, and Kx is centered around 401. Minus width, Ky, centered around 301. Boom, there's the filter. And all we gotta do to apply this filter to this signal is just say, all right, uh, BTSF, which is the B in the transform domain shifted, filtered. Does that make sense, what all those thing, little things make? It's you take your transform signal times the filter, and there you go, that's, that's what you got. What's that? Yes, thanks, there we go, yeah. Perfect, yeah, so I, I multiply by F, which gives me an F, I, I, yeah, BTS times an F gives me BTSF. That's simple math. Okay, that's like fourth grade. Like my daughter can do that. Okay, that's how it works. Uh, yeah, so now we have this thing here, which is a shifted sort of filtered image of the original signal. And all I have to do now is take this thing. Before I do the inverse Fourier transform, by the way, I have to unshift it and then IFFT to it. Okay? That's the danger of working in with the FFT. You have to remember, you FFT it, you shift it. It, it always shifts, you have to unshift, you do operations, and you have to shift it back to do the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, just keep that in mind. All right, so, um, so what I gotta do is I gotta build BT, ready? BTF, I'm gonna drop that S. How do I do that mathematically? <laughs> well, it's obvious, you, uh, you just do that. See what happens mathematically, there's an S kind of in the middle which subtracts from there to go there. Okay, you got all that math? Okay, there we go. I just undid this shift. Took this thing, unshifted it. IFFT shift, by the way, works with whatever dimension you're in. There's no IFFT shift two, three, whatever. It just says, okay, look, if you're a matrix, I know you're doing two dimensions. If you're a cube, I know you're doing three dimensions. If you're a vector, you're doing one. It just shifts however. Okay, so you undo the shift. Now I just have it in the Fourier domain. How do I get that F off of there? First I don't. <laughs> Slick pants. All right. All right, ready? Okay. Uh, BF. In our house, that means burger fries. Okay? So when we want to go to BF, that's McDonald's usually. Uh, BF is just going to be the IFFT2 of BTF. And it's very clear how the math works here. The two Fs here in between the I and T makes it, means that you subtract the F there. It'd be, be, I mean, the T, sorry. Oh, I almost got confused with my math. There we go. There's your filtered image, all right, BF. So we have to start with B, which is the beautiful image. BF is the beautifully filtered image. Okay. B was not so beautiful. It actually had all that noise on it. And this is going to give us now a new, sig a new picture or image that's been filtered with this Gaussian, okay? And that's how you build the, that little filter. So this looks a lot like your dog problem, right? You built this three-dimensional filter, except it wasn't at the zero wavelength. And part of the whole point of this is your dog saving techniques are directly applicable to saving art, okay? Time frequency analysis is all about thinking about things in time or frequency, whichever's going to work best and however you can actually process the data. Okay, so most stuff gets processed in the frequency domain because there it's kind of more clear what's going on oftentimes. You don't see the image, but you, you have this 
idea of content and frequency. You say, oh, you know, I can shave all this stuff off. I know very fine scales aren't there, so I can shave off high frequencies. And that's what we just did. Okay, so now we need to plot this stuff. All right, so we have a subplot going already. We have this figure with these subplots up here. Now what we're going to do here is do a subplot of 2, 2, 3. And subplot 2, 2, 3 will be the key p color of log of the absolute value of BTSF. Shading and turf. Color map gray. All right. Everybody go with that? So we're going to just take this filtered uh, in, uh, Fourier domain picture, plot it just like before, and then in subplot 2, 2, 2, 2, 4. What we're going to plot now is plot, we're going to go to image show. We're going to take this thing, convert it back, uh, BF, and plot back to JPEG. Okay, everybody go with that? We took the image, put it in the Fourier domain, filtered, bring it back. Simple process, ultimately. Okay, not that much coding even. Now let's see how it did. All right. There's how it did. You start off with this. Here's your... Before you transform that, you filtered it. Look at all that black over here. You just hacked that off pretty hard. You actually, uh, it turns out with the shading and turf, it kind of, it gives you this ball instead. It doesn't give you the fine scale stuff. Fine, fine, fine. We'll come back to that. And there's your image. Focus harder. Okay. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps we've over filtered. We chose this filter with. We can choose it to be something else. That's how awesome we are. So part of what we're going to do now is play around with this and see how this gets resolved. Now, first of all, you clearly have killed all the fine scale structure. There's no doubt there's nothing left that's fine scale. However, perhaps you've overdone it because you still can't quite, is that a cup? I don't know. It still could be a grandma. All right, so uh, easy enough to do. How do you change this? Well, let's make the filter a little bit wider, 0 0.001. Ooh, look at that. Starting to come into focus. Look at, see, nice. See, we took that. We just, boom, cleaned it up right here in class. Took us all 20 minutes, okay? So you can go through your whole digital library and filter all your pictures. You know, blur out your edges, blur out all your fine, your unfine detail. So it's nice. It's kind of like a pedicure, I mean, face cure. Face, what's that called? Facial. Facial. Yeah, yeah. Smooths everything out. You pay a lot of money for that. Here, you could just do it for free. <laughs> MATLAB. <laughs> Look at that. A facial. It's great. I need that. Uh, so we're getting there. In fact, here's what we're going to do next. Let's build a little routine, and the routine's going to do the following. We're going to put it in a loop. And what we're going to do is just start changing the filter width. And what we're going to see is, I'm just going to plot the final image here. And we're going to plot no filter. And we're going to just kind of walk this filter through to be very broad. So here, look how much wider it is, by the way. And we're just going to take this thing from unfiltered and just start walking it through and just keep making It's like a little movie, just like we did in the time frequency picture where we slid this uh, the Gavor window around and made, you know, kind of looked at it as a movie, as time frames. We're going to do this with this image now. Okay. So let's come over here. So all we've got to do is loop it. Uh, so first of all, I don't want all these subplots anymore. So I'm going to just uh, do the following. Where, where am I filtering? Right here? Here. So let's copy this. This will be figure two. Now, the parameter we're going to change is width. By the way, width zero, e to the zero is sweet, no filtering. Right? 
So we're going to walk this through, and we're going to start it from zero and start walking it through and plot out the final image, which is uh, this BF, okay, that you get. Oh, I got to bring these down too. Okay. So let me copy these down here. Okay. Here are all the commands we used, and let's go through and make a loop. So the width variable, width will be go from 0 to 0.1. Actually, let's do the following. Uh, it's going to be a linear space that goes from 0 to 0.1 in, I don't know, let's do uh, 50. So it's going to basically walk from 0 to, to 0.1 in 50 steps. Okay, that's what this width is going to do. And so what now we're going to do is make a loop. Take this out of here and say, okay, fine. For j equals 1 to length of width. End. I like to tab these in. So, so every time I come in here, and then this is going to be width, not just width, it's going to be width j. This will be width j. Okay, so the code, start, here's your width variables. Can you guys see that? Do I need to move up a little bit? Let me just move it up a little bit here. Figure two. Walk it through, 50 steps. So what we're going to see is 50 images, and just think this watch thing, thing as it changes. Okay? Every time we pick a new width, we're going to do a, change the filter, multiply it by this BTS. Right, which is the signal in the, the image in the uh, shifted image in the uh, Fourier domain, and then we're going to multiply by the filter, and then we're going to inverse shift that, plot it. Or sorry, and then bring it back to snort. Now we just have to plot it. That's the last thing to do, and so that is just going to be. Well, I'll just copy this line of code right here. There, and don't forget to draw now. And maybe we'll pause it for 0.1 seconds. I don't really need to. No, let's not. Let's just let it walk through as it is. And if it's too fast, we can always slow it down. Everybody go with that? There it is. I think it's right. Anybody want to tell me to stop? I don't have any candy, but nobody has any corrections yet. OK. Boom. OK, there was the first figure. And here's figure two. Oh. There it is, walking through. Okay, uh, something's not right. Didn't it start from zero with no filter, right? Yeah. Uh, whoa, blurry. Okay, uh, so something's wrong. All right, so let me first of all, um, let me get rid of these plotting things up here. Comment. Okay, so let's spot what is wrong here. Um, I am show. It would get. I, I expect the filter. It got blurrier and blurrier, but it should start off looking. Because you're filtering out more and more. Right, but the first image should have been uh, just the the image unfiltered, and it seemed like it just started on the last image. Let me try one thing, which is, um, how do you clear the plot again? Clear the screen on the plot? Do you remember? Yeah, no, let's, no. CLF, let's, let's do, okay, there we go. Let's, let's just see if it's holding on to what it was before. I don't think I'm, uh, so probably I'm holding on to something here I shouldn't. Uh, BTS never changes, right? I just multiply by new filter every time. Oh, let's let's get rid of this. Sorry. Let's also do this. Okay. Let's try this again real quick. Okay, that's kind of there, isn't it? The first one was. Maybe it's too slow at the beginning. Okay. 
Yeah. So we probably don't want all your space because it goes really quick. Um, we kind of want more like uh, more stuff close to zero. So let, let's, oh, and steps of, oh. Oh, it goes from zero to one to point one. Let's, let's do this and let's do more. And let's, um, I think we can do that. Okay. Okay, there, there you go. Okay, now you're seeing the process happen, right? You start it off with noise. It's, it's more and more fine scales being lost. And, and eventually what's going to happen is you start just blurring out the whole image, right? So, but there is a point at which this thing almost has an ideal behavior or a, kind of like your best cleanup that you could do. Okay, and that was around, well, this demo didn't quite go as well as I thought. But anyway, <laughs> I tried, I tried. I was trying to make a cool movie for you. Maybe if it was in color, maybe you'd like it more. We could put it color map hot on it. That would look better. But there you go. That's too blurry. And at the beginning, it wasn't good enough. But you could see, by the way, that I'm far away probably where, from where I want to be. I really want to be closer to the filter, in other words, can be very broad. That's, I think, the ultimate message here in looking at this specific plot, which is if I now break this here, this told me that the best behavior actually happened when I have this filter being uh, very, very wide. So let's even make it wider here. And let's just see how this cleans up the image. See, I mean, that's a pretty good cleanup right there. Is everybody OK with that one? So I don't need a lot of filtering. I have this very broad thing. All it's doing is killing off stuff here. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty huge improvement right there, going from here to there. You can kind of see it. Notice the filter's broad enough that, look, you can even see some of the fine scale structure there on that cup, right? You haven't lost that level of fine scale. And in fact, ahead of time, you can calculate what these, free, what these spatial components are, right? You can even say, I want those features in my final product, and you say, I better not filter them out. But I actually know exactly what frequencies they are. So I, don't, I can set my filter to do this. And we're going to do the same thing. But we're going to do now, instead of the Gaussian filter, we're going to use a Shannon filter. And the Shannon filter is basically going to take this, and instead of multiplying this by a Gaussian, which sort of falls off, it's just going to basically be a square. The filter is going to be. One inside the square, zero outside. Okay, it's a step function filter. Anything out here, outside that square, just goes to zero. Okay, so it's a, it's a very sharp filtering, and it's a cutoff filter. Okay, and we're gonna look at what happens to the image processing in that case as well. Okay, so let's build a Shannon filter. Um, by the way, uh, you build different filters for different reasons. If you have a, a good reason of why you'd want or you suspect that a Shannon filter would be better in your certain application, then you need that. I mean, the Shannon filter is a very harsh filter. It has a very sharp cutoff of frequencies. And for instance, you may know that, hey, you know what? Beyond a certain frequency in my application, I know there should be none of these frequencies. Cut them off. They're done. The other thing you can do, by the way, with Shannon filtering, or any of these filters, right? And this is what kind of what Wavelets does. It says, there's some features that I want to pick up at a certain wavelength. And there's a bunch of features at this wavelength. And everything in between, I think, is kind of noise. Well, you could certainly filter at these. You can build a band pass around those filter frequencies. And you can build a band pass over here. You can put the filter anything, anywhere you want, right? You have that option. You have that control. And that's very important for image processing, is you can say, there's some key features at this frequency, key features at this frequency. I want to highlight those, build filters around them, kill everything else off. That's what's left, off, left over. In other words, I could calculate also on that cup what its frequency components are. And I know there's a lot of frequency content. I could build a filter around low frequency and a filter right around the frequencies of the markings of the cup, filter those out specifically. All right, but let's build this Shannon uh, filter real quick here. 
And basically, the Shannon filter, FS, let's call it, filter Shannon. We could capitalize his name, but that would be, well, wouldn't be keeping with all our little subscripts. Uh, and basically, we're going to start off with FS being a bunch of zeros. Uh, and this is zeros of a, uh, basically, it's going to be a 600 by 800 matrix, right? And now what we want to do is decide how big we want our filter to be, how big a rectangle we want to keep out, and wherever we want that rectangle to be, put ones there. Okay? So for instance, you could say now the width parameters, remember this 800 by 600, let's say the width is 50. So if I'm focused in around the middle of that plot, it's 800 by 600, 50 is going to be, I'm going to go 50 this way, 50 this way. So I'm going to take 100 modes this way and 100 modes this way. Okay? So that's what I mean by 50. So how do I do that? Well, here's how you'd build a filter that would just do a step function. This is probably one of the uh, more simple ways to do this. You'd say, okay, my filter is going to be the following. Filter is going to be, uh, so I, I take this FS and I'm going to say, look, from 301 minus width, okay, steps of 1 to 301 uh, plus width. So does everybody get that? So I'm going to go from 301 minus 50 to 301 plus 50. 301 where's where I'm centered. And then I'm going to just pick out everything around it. Okay. And uh, so I have that, and then actually, should that be that should be four four hundred, right? So sorry, that's the x. No, it's six hundred by eight hundred, right? So okay, I had it right. And then in the wide here, you got four hundred one minus width. Steps of one to four hundred one plus width is equal to. And here, what you want to build is the ones matrix. Ones, and how big is this? Uh, it's one to two times width plus one. One to two times width plus one. I'm missing one. Oh, equals. Oh, right here. All right. Okay, I got to throw out some candy now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what did this do? I ripped out the middle of my filter, and what I put in there is a bunch of ones. Okay? And they're ones, because this is, remember I go from 301 plus 50, 301 plus, there's a total of two times width plus the, first, the zeroth point. So that's the two plus one, two plus one. Okay? So what I did is built a little rectangle. And then with that rectangle, I can now filter. So that's my filter. That's it. That's a Shannon filter. And we can plot what the Shannon filter does now. Oh, yes. That would be great. Ro, just always right after I press the button, you could be earning so much candy today. There. There is the Shannon filter. Check it out. That's the window I said could live. That's my filter box. Amazingly enough, take this, I get this. How much image compression, look at, not only did I clean up the image, the area in here is a fraction of the total thing. I could just basically represent all my data. I compress this thing 95% with that little box. And I get a better image at the end of the day. So hopefully you learned a couple things. Images are no different than any other data. Your data you're going to be looking with at raw data is no different than an image. All the same processing tools are going to be coming together in this form, right? That's one thing. Two, hopefully you learned a little bit about data compression. Three, you hopefully learned about sweet cappuccino mugs. All right, see you guys Friday. More image analysis.